I'm going to interrupt you, I'm afraid, once again, uh, but I would say once again for very good cause because we have another fantastic speaker with us for the keynote luncheon address. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Raj Punjabi. Dr. Punjabi is co-founder and CEO of Last Mile Health, a nonprofit organization that has done remarkable work in providing health care to some of the most remote villages in the world. He is also an instructor in medicine at the Harvard Medical School and associate physician in the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Dr. Punjabi grew up in Liberia and at age nine fled the country with his family when civil war broke out. He received his medical and public health training at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, Massachusetts General Hospital, and the Harvard Medical School. Dr. Punjabi returned to Liberia as a 24-year-old medical student to serve the people he had left behind. With $6,000 he had received as a wedding gift, he, along with American healthcare workers and Liberian Civil War survivors, began treating HIV patients in a gutted closet in a war-torn building in Zwedru, Liberia. Right from the start, they realized that the greatest needs were in the remote, last-mile communities that had no access to health care due to distance and poverty. And I think uh, Professor Amani Jamal shared with us a photograph earlier today that made vivid the difficulty of that last mile. They came up with a groundbreaking solution, Last Mile Health, whose mission is to recruit, train, equip, manage, and pay community members as health workers to provide health care in their own villages and link them to the rural primary health system. That formula has been remarkably successful. Doctors affiliated with Last Mile Health have published articles in The Lancet and the Journal of the American Medical Association, and the organization has been featured by The Wall Street Journal, NPR, and The New York Times. Last Mile Health has grown to become a global organization of more than 200 that serves as a dedicated partner to the Liberia Ministry of Health. In 2015, and I warned you this would be a theme, Fortune Magazine, Fortune Magazine named Dr. Punjabi one of the world's 50 greatest leaders, joining Jeremy Farrar on that list. He is also a Forbes 400 philanthropy fellow, a Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation social entrepreneur, an Echoing Green Fellow, and a Clinton Global Initiative Advisor. In addition, Dr. Punjabi is a recipient of the Global Citizen Movement Award. Dr. Punjabi's commitment to providing medical care to people in the far corners of the globe is an exceptional example of the decisive action that can make a difference to the problems that we are discussing at this conference. I am delighted that he is with us today, and I ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Raj Punjabi. Boy, if uh, brown people could turn red. Um, I <laughs> Thank you for that very, very generous in, um, introduction. I am honored to be here. Uh, who's, having, uh, who's learning something at this conference? Good, yeah. And, and how many, you know, I, I, I realized talking to some students earlier, how many of you are students? Great, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, so the, the, the web conference didn't get you, huh? You know, it is exciting to be, uh, this is my first trip to Ireland, and uh, I'm very grateful to the, the, the Fung Forum staff who's able to bring my, my family with me. I, uh, it, 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 you can imagine flying over on Halloween is exciting for any toddlers in the world. I've got um, a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and uh, celebrating Halloween anywhere is exciting, but doing it in the birthplace of Halloween in Ireland is, of course, very, very thrilling. Um, my three-year-old has uh, not taken a moment uh, to take off his Spider-Man outfit. Some of you have seen him at the hotel, mask and all. And, you know, whereas in, in Boston, he'd get weird looks on non-Halloween days for wearing that. Here, he's been quite a little mini celebrity. He's gotten <laughs> all kinds of shout-outs. In fact, yesterday uh, at the park, there was an old, uh, an, an, an elderly Irish gentleman who uh, was sitting at a bench, saw them playing in the leaves, and walked over and handed, um, handed Spider-Man two euros. Uh, <laughs> so 
I, I, you know, it is profound, of course, to think about Halloween, um, not only because of, 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 the, of the celebration. Um, it is, of course, a celebration of life being All Saints Day, All Souls Day, and uh, it's very profound to reflect on it at this conference, um, being a day and a time when we remember those who've died. We know how many people died in this crisis in Ebola, and I want to talk about uh, the, the local health workers, um, over, four, over 500 local health workers. The response, by the way, was 98% local, according to the UN. Um, over 500 local health workers lost their lives uh, trying to care for the thousands of patients that were involved. And I want to start, because it is this time of the year, uh, by asking if you will allow me for a moment of silence in rem remembrance of them. Thank you. Thank you. You see, I want to talk today about what many of us have been talking about at this conference in one form or another, which is the power of these local frontline health workers, the power of these workers not only to fight modern plagues, but to achieve that lofty goal of bringing health care to the furthest reaches of the planet so that we cover all people. I want to talk about their power to respond to Ebola and I want to talk about how they have taught us, amongst many lessons, that we are not defined by the pandemics or the crises that strike our lives. We are defined by how we respond. Uh, this is a very personal, um, uh, as I imagine it's to many of you, to go through crises. For me, uh, it certainly was. This is um, me when I was in the fourth grade in Monrovia. I, my parents immigrated from... India to Liberia, and I grew up there, and, and it's, it's a, be a beautiful country. Um, I, it, it is still a beautiful country. It's got tremendous rainforests and beaches, and the people are incredible. It's an incredibly important historical country, having been founded by freed slaves. And uh, this is me in actually an in international school um, with, uh, in the fourth grade with Miss Samuels. And uh, I was nine years old when this picture was taken, our yearbook picture. Um, it happened to be the, uh, the last picture we took together as a class, because when I was nine years old, the Civil War that we've heard referenced at this conference happened. Context, of course, is critical for this understanding of where epidemics and pandemics happen, where modern plagues happen. When I was nine years old, the Civil War erupted in the countryside. A man named Charles Taylor recruited several militia men across the border and jumped into Liberia from Burkina and, and Guinea and Ivory Coast and started their march for months down to the capital where I was in school. We heard rumors, we heard, saw people rushing into the city and finally our school ended up shutting down. Of course I was thrilled at that point being nine years old and having a school vacation uh, until we realized how uncertain in, uh, the moment was. You see, the rebels ended up capturing the international airport, the only international airport we had, and so then people started fleeing in a panic all of a sudden. My mom came knocking on the door one morning and said, Raj, pack your things, we gotta go. So of course, as a nine-year-old, I packed uh, the first thing nine-year-olds would pack, which were all my action figures uh, and toys. We were rushed into the center of town, and there on the tarmac, we're split into two lines. I stood with my mother and sister in one line. We were stuffed into the cargo hatch of a rescue plane. As I sat there on that bench in the back of the plane, I looked over out the hatch, and there were hundreds of Liberians, children strapped to their backs, who were trying to jump in the hatch with us. And I watched soldiers stop them from doing that. They restrained them. They were not allowed to flee. You see, we were the lucky ones. We had a chance to get out, Ended up in Freetown, Sierra Leone first, uh, and then North Carolina. We were very fortunate that a family was able to take us in. I had a chance, uh, because of the greatness of American public education, to go to college and eventually to med school. And 
As, although I was nine when it happened, as many nine-year-olds know, you may not know the cause of suffering, um, but you can certainly tell when something's wrong, and that, like m many of us throughout childhood, have formative experiences. For me, it was reflection. And I thought back to that moment and wanted to go back. In fact, it was a very exciting moment to do so because 10 years ago when I was in medical school, uh, the president of Liberia, a new president had just been elected. The war had ended. The president of Liberia was the first African woman president. She won the Nobel Peace Prize for her work. And there was a big revival in the country. So I had a heart full of hope. Um, my fiance at the time with me, and we went back. Uh, I went back to Liberia. And what I found was just utter destruction. Utter destruction. Imagine having a capital city with no electricity. Imagine having a capital city with no running water. Imagine having a capital city with not a single traffic light and trying to rebuild. War destroys. It destroys, and crises destroy physical infrastructure, but the biggest destruction from the war was the human infrastructure that was lost. We had 51 doctors left to serve a country of four and a half million people. For a rough equivalent, for those of you from Ireland, you know that that is about the population of Ireland. So imagine Ireland running its health system with 51 physicians. Imagine trying to take on Ebola and how difficult that would be. We were working as in remote rural areas. Because those few doctors that remained after the war worked in cities, in the rural countryside, people were dying often anonymously. And when they weren't dying anonymously and they were known to us, they were dying from things, as you know, Jeremy brought up, uh, earlier today from conditions that people just should not have to die from in the 21st century. Newborn girls, six days old, mother had to walk eight hours to get to the clinic. So she comes in and her lungs sound like choking car engines when you put your stethoscope on her. Deprived of antibiotics, oxygen in a rural clinic, all because the staff, the, the, the international staff in that particular case supporting the clinic didn't think it was possible to provide oxygen in that place. Doing CPR on a 19-year-old because she was caught in a spontaneous abortion. She had sepsis in her uterus. She ended up coming to the hospital. She was bleeding from everywhere. This was the pattern, and this still is the pattern, for many, many, too many people on our planet who live in the world's most remote villages. What kind of places am I talking about? I just got back from Liberia two weeks ago. I am OK. Um, we, we, what's amazing now is we can hug, um, which imagine the kind of impact. That Mr. Fung asked about this yesterday. Um, you know, imagine going to a country where you cannot touch people. You cannot handshake. You can only bump elbows. That has now changed. We're back to hugging. But I went out into a canoe uh, down the river onto the other side in the rainforest alongside the beach, into a motorbike, into another canoe, then walk for two to three hours to get to one of these villages. They're isolated, remote areas. And they number too small to matter in too many circles, in the public sector, the private sector, the social sector. Right? There aren't that many people in these places in any one particular country, but there are many people in the world that lives in these places. And they're extremely important for pandemics. Why? Because we've heard this already. Right? Margaret Chan yesterday said zoonoses are the primary culprit in emerging new human infections. We know that's true now. It was probably true historically. Uh, the major diseases that start uh, as zoonoses start in remote rural areas. And whether they start there or they're the hardest to control, as was these last cases of smallpox in Ethiopia, in those remote rural areas, those places are critical. It's no different with Ebola, right? We know that. This young little lad, oh, about the age of my toddlers, um, came down, Emil, with a fever, vomiting, and diarrhea in a little village called Miliandu, about 28 homes, about 200 people. In the same rainforest we all work with, that was the main primary source of this virus and the epidemic. And he came sick in December 2013. He fell sick, his mother fell sick, his sisters fell sick, and he died initially at least, to the world anonymously. He wasn't known. Until it was March, when the disease had already spread to several villages, much like the ones I've been describing. 
and spread until it hits cities, and we know the rest of the story. So let's talk about the cause. There are many causes, so I don't want to oversimplify it. But one thing we know from epidemiology and geography is that, and real estate, is that location, location, location matters, right? This is the population at risk for Ebola in, in Central and Western Africa. Here's what the infrastructure looks like. The, um, this is a map of the roads in those regions. Uh, the red, which you can barely see, are primary roads. Primary means they actually have asphalt on them. There are secondary roads, which are primarily mud, but are shaped as roads and sculpted as roads and maintained as roads. And the green, which is the predominance, are tracks. What this means for two-year-old boys that get sick with febrile illnesses is that their mother has to throw them on her back, get into a canoe, get to the other side, and then walk for up to two days just to get a diagnosis. How can you treat Ebola or any plague for that matter if you do not extend healthcare to these places? How can we do that? This isn't just borne out in stories and anecdotes. There's data for this. This is data from the work we've done with the Ministry of Health, some population-based surveys, looking at the probability of accessing basic maternal care. You're 82% less likely if you live 25 kilometers out from the nearest clinic. And there are plenty of people that live there. Same thing for child health. 82% of the providers are informal providers. Um, traditional healers when you have a fever. Global health has many um, paradoxes, and here's a major one. So we've seen a surge in billions of dollars in global health spending in the last several years, and it's impressive, it truly is. It's solved a lot of issues. Liberia's been a beneficiary of that support, both domestically and internationally. We've, got, we've increased the amount of dollars we spend in healthcare. We were spending, in 2005-06, three dollars per capita, three dollars per capita on the entire, in, in healthcare in the country. By 2014, right before Ebola hit, the bank reports, the World Bank reports that we were spending 44 dollars per capita. So that's still far from where it should be, but it's a big rise, it's over tenfold. That was nationally. The yellow and red spots on this map are places that are considered remote districts. In these communities, 60% of the rural population lives out of reach of the nearest clinic, according to the WHO's definition. They have to walk somewhere between four to eight hours or longer to get there. Some communities have to walk 22 hours to get to a clinic. Here's the spending in one of those districts, Konobo district in the red uh, on, in, in Grand Jide, um, here. We don't actually know the data from the other sites. This is what was budgeted for. Usually budgeted spending in, in low-income countries, at least in rural areas, uh, people spend less. So 76 cents, what can you get for that? And why does this happen? And so, uh, you know, this, it, it, if we are gonna solve the crisis of modern plagues, we have to change this. The fact that for all of human history, illness has been universal, access to care has not. And we actually have the chance to change that now, right? There's a billion people actually in the world, a seventh of the planet, that lives in these communities. They may not be that prominent in any one country, though they are in some like Liberia or the Democratic Republic of Congo or in the Central and Western African belt, but they still exist. They exist in America. And I'm excited to be here with a group of scholars who are coming from a multidisciplinary perspective at, at Princeton uh, and elsewhere. Um, because I think part of the challenge is to better understand these blind spots. And that is not just a implementation exercise, it is a scholarly exercise. It's a policy exercise. Let me tell you what I mean. So if you look at uh, health spending in these areas, we track it dollar per person. When those people are spread in 42 villages across the size of an entire state, rather than clustered in one place. The operating costs are higher to serve them. The implementation costs are higher to serve them. We are blinded in the way that we provide those dollars. When we look at health worker density, we say it's 2.7 or 2.8 workers per thousand is our goal, right? That's the minimum goal. 2.7 workers per thousand people doesn't tell you whether those thousand people are clustered in one village or in 20 villages. And if they're in 20 villages, your costs change. You know, public health physicians like myself can't understand that problem. I'm probably giving a very superficial and oversimplified version of it, but economists can, policymakers can, demographers can, geographers can. And it goes beyond health, the kind of data we need about these blind spots. The census, and, and uh, this is not on the record, the census in some of these places is off by 50%, the census. 
on which we build so much of the data for democracy itself. I mentioned the triple bias. And what I mean by that is that these communities, the private sector doesn't think of them as opportunities for markets because there are not enough consumers in one place. The public sector doesn't think of them as priorities because there are not enough political power, votes in one place. And the social sector is even, which is supposed to fill in during these times, is disincentivized because we shoot for scale, scale, scale more people. If it costs more to serve 1,000 people across 100 villages versus 1,000 people in one village, guess which one the executive's gonna pick. So we need your help in the scholarly community uh, in economics and political science and anthropology. I was a student of anthropology. Um, uh, to figure out how we can close these blind spots. And the good news is we have some places to look for solutions. We've talked about local health workers, uh, which I've been, I've been so proud of the questions and, the, and, and some of the panelists that have, have highlighted this um, because it has been essential. Um, this is not, as, as Jeremy said, a moment or a reason to be a bystander to history, a passive bystander to history. We can solve this. You see, we've been working on, uh, in remote villages with community health workers like some of you have. And why are these people important? Well, they're important in any regard. You don't only need them in rural remote areas, you need them in cities as well. But in rural remote areas, they're often the first and sometimes the only point of contact, if they exist at all. And if they do exist, what we were finding early on in our work for the last 10 years is that they often failed. They often failed, why? Because you take a woman like Zakpa, who's up here, who is eighth grade educated, who lives in a village called Bilibo, that is eight hours away from the nearest clinic in the middle of a rainforest. She's one part of this, one of these hunting communities that has been so spotlighted in the Ebola crisis. And she doesn't have a job. And she wants to become a leader. And usually the approach to community health workers is to have a village chief nominate somebody like her, and you send them off for training. They get trained maybe for a few days, maybe for a couple of weeks, maybe on a couple of diseases. They get sent back. They're not equipped. No one comes back with the supply chain. Amazing work that's done by some of you on ORS, oral rehydration salts, for instance, never gets in their backpacks because the supply chain is weak. And they're rarely paid. In fact, Liberia was calling them volunteers. So at Last Mile Health, our mission is to save lives in the world's most remote villages, and we've been working as a starting point on the community health worker issue, and actually just trying to ask the question, could you actually double down on the way we train, supervise, coach, pay, recruit these workers? Could you professionalize and standardize that workforce? And if you did that, could you actually generate greater value, greater utilization, optimize the investments that are being made in these workers, and actually save more lives where they hadn't been uh, cared for before? I'll give you an example, and I won't, I won't get into the details here, but uh, for instance, most programs either don't supervise their workers, or if they do, they use a non-clinician. In our program, we've got a nurse uh, that actually goes out on a motorbike, uh, uh, and her whole job is to coach 15 of these workers on their clinical skills, to tell you if there's non-severe pneumonia or severe pneumonia. Why is that important, I'll get into, because it, how we invest in these workers is critical for stopping modern plagues. They can tell you the difference between fever from an infection, uh, that is malaria or perhaps another cause. And they can help triage, right? That's critical. And we pay these workers and tie it to their performance, right? So that's the kind of innovation. What we were seeing early on, right before Ebola, is that people like Zakba could actually take on 40, 50 medical skills from screening kids for malnutrition to diagnosing a cause of a child's fever uh, and do this with quite high performance. 96% uh, uh, accuracy rate for, uh, amongst these workers for actually tria uh, de de deciding between pneumonia and non-severe, severe pneumonia and non-severe pneumonia, for instance. Prenatal care, I mean, they had gone so far that I even probably have gotten my blood, in fact, I know I've gotten my blood pressure checked there uh, at least eight more times than I have uh, in, at any Harvard teaching hospital. And they've done a pretty good job, because I double check. <laughs> the impact of these workers can be strong. The power of these workers can be tremendous even in everyday times, right? The everyday crisis of malaria, the everyday crisis of complications of childbirth. And they can certainly be impactful at times of crisis. Last year, we were told, and this has been cited many times here, we could see at this point a year ago as many as 1.4 million cases in my country and the ones next to it. 1.4 million cases? It might have been a model. But that's exactly what it started to feel like at that moment in August and September when we were there. 
We were never told projections that horrific that most of those people would die. Even during our Civil War, we never had projections that horrific. And in the middle of that crisis, a year ago, I was standing there with, um, in Riverses County, where some of you have, have likely worked, um, with the CDC, with the government of Liberia, with MSF, um, and we were there after a woman from Monrovia got infected with Ebola, couldn't find a treatment bed in the capital, and decided, like many of us would, when we're sick, to go to where her relatives are. Where are her relatives? They were in a place called Kaya. Kaya is a small, remote village that's 10 hours away from Monrovia. There are no bridges that work. There are no roads that work. There's no electricity. There's no telecommunications. She gets there. She dies. This is, by the way, in October. This is months after the, weeks after the response had started. The messaging had gotten out about Ebola. This community still was not aware how to safely bury their dead. And they had no health workers to help them do it in the first place. So she died. 14 days later, 14 more people that attended her funeral died. And that's when the message got taken to people like Lorenzo. Right? These frontline health workers are critical for halting epidemics. Lorenzo is a man who left as a refugee during the war, came back as a physician assistant, dedicated to serve his country. He left a safe area, a non-hot zone, and decided he was going to come and help respond. Imagine the courage one has to have to deal with Ebola in any circumstance. And those of you that are health workers know that even in the best biosafety hazard ha labs, even in the best infection control hospitals in the world's richest places, you still feel uncomfortable when you have a highly infectious disease that could kill you around you. You will dedicate yourself to caring for that patient, the same type of passion that Lorenzo had, but he had to do it with this team of government folks and MSF in a rainforest. Imagine having to go door to door with a needle and a syringe and to take blood out of the vein of people and you don't even know who has a fever and who doesn't. And you gotta do that again and again and those people's lives depend on that because you cannot transport a village of 5,000 people across bridges like the one you just saw to get them to a lab testing facility. You've gotta transport their specimens. And that's what these people did and they went door to door to find, door to door to find those who'd been exposed and get them into care. That's the kind of response that occurred throughout this crisis in remote rural areas. This is just data from a couple of sites that we worked on collaboratively with a number of folks in this room, including USAID and the CDC and the government of Liberia, MSF, Direct Relief. But this and local caregivers, the relatives of those patients, did this over and over and over again throughout our country. And that's how these curves bent. That was a big part of it. Liberia became the first country months ago, weeks ago, to be declared Ebola free. And we are gonna get there in all three countries. Uh, and what's important is what we do with what we've learned. The president of Liberia now recognizes community health workers, paid community health workers, had the most important and effective role in this fight. And that's not to diminish the value of labs or hospitals, that all was needed. And a lot of that's dependent on what these workers do. We cannot stop modern plagues without rural frontline health workers. We recognize that. The CDC recognizes that. Mr. Fung asked another question yesterday, which is how can you reduce the shock from epidemics? Well, in places around Liberia, we did see that shock. Facility-based delivery dropped 300%. These are mothers who were going to clinics who didn't even have Ebola who decided not to go to clinics because they thought they'd catch Ebola from a health worker that was in the clinic. In fact, we've done studies to show that this isn't just data, this is from clinic data, uh, but we've done population-based data that we're gonna publish soon that shows the odds of going to the clinic for a delivery during the crisis was 30% less than it was um, uh, before in, uh, the crisis. It didn't have to happen this way. It didn't have to happen this way. This is Alice Johnson, who's a nurse that grew up in the same city I did in Monrovia, decided to leave her own toddler to go work in a place where there was no telecommunication so she could coach these workers. She is that razzmatazz nurse that sits on a motorbike every week and goes out and coaches these workers. She knew how smart and gifted these people are. So she helped keep facility-based deliveries, that network did, going, it only dropped 3% in some of the sites, albeit a less affected zone in terms of Ebola, but no less affected in terms of the fear and stigma from Ebola. Kept sick child treatment going. 
You know, this is how unequal things got. In facilities, we told health workers, stop touching patients to make sure you're protected. If the mother says a child has a fever, you just treat presumptively for malaria, which is probably the right thing to do. You might over-treat some kids, but you save a lot of kids from dying from malaria, and more kids had malaria than they had Ebola even during the crisis. None of that was applied to the community level, except it, where Alice thought of a, the same protocol being applied to community health workers. And they were able to not miss a single dose of treatment for kids with malaria um, and pneumonia during this crisis, while keeping health workers safe. You know, in basketball, um, which was my favorite sport as, as an American, uh, we say that the best uh, offense is a good defense. And I think in global health, the best defense is a good offense. And that means targeting these investments to r rural and remote areas. You see, in global health, we've gone through a history where we focused on what. Jeremy talked about the, the verticalization. Is it HIV treatment? Is it malaria? Then we, talked, we started to talk about the how. What's the system? How do you get this out to places? We have not done enough talking about the who and the where. Where is that being targeted? And I think if we do, we'll start to change uh, our risk for modern plagues going haywire. What do we do with this? Here's the opportunity. We have recognized these workers, and I want to thank our friends in the media, like Sherry and others, who actually spent time working on this crisis and reporting it, because I tell you, that also bent the arc of that curve in a tremendous way. Um, and we are grateful for that, especially those like Michael from the Washington Post who lost their lives. There were others who lost their lives. These workers should not have risked as much as they did. These are Alice's mentors who lost their lives. And if we are serious about making sure modern plagues stop or get reduced in terms of their impact, if we are serious about extending health care to all, we have an opportunity to do it. The government has taken forward a solution, a national community health workforce that's part of a national plan. This would be to get 5,000 workers, community health professionals amongst others, doctors and hospital managers, and rebuild that human infrastructure. Put 5,000 workers across the entire country. They've costed it, they have a budget for it, they know it's gonna serve 1.2 million people. There'll be almost 5,000 workers with 300 nurses, and this would be historic. Not only because it's going to stop, help stop the next Ebola or detect it early and respond to it, but also because it's going to extend healthcare to people in the first place. What's the return on investment for something like this? It's tremendous. The health is not a, healthcare is not a economy, a, a, a loss to the economy. It's not a loss leader. We've, we've just done a study with the UN, the World Bank, and others that showed the return on investment, the investment case for scaling professionalized community health workers. Now, what we found is that if you put a dollar in, you get $10 out, and you get that through product, more productive and healthier lives, because more lives get saved. You get job creation in places where unemployment can be 85 to 90 percent, and you help stop and detect epidemics. 750,000 of these workers are needed, it's estimated, in sub-Saharan Africa. You know what that would cost? A measly $2 billion a year. That's it. That's not a lot of money. In Liberia, this would be 6% of the total spending seven years from now, in a very, very poor country. That would return $22 billion to the economies of these countries. This is the power of these workers, and I think we have a chance to change that in these countries and in other places where pandemics are likely to strike. It is true we are not defined by the crises that strike our lives. It is true that we are defined by how we respond to them. That is certainly the key fundamental lesson I've learned from these workers. A health worker for everyone, everywhere. That's the only real response to pandemics and the Ebola crisis and the everyday crisis of premature death. And if we are serious about our response, then our, and we are defined by that response, then our response too must make it possible for us to achieve that goal. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to take questions, yeah. You can ask about Spider-Man outfits if you'd like. Uh, thank you for that great presentation. Thank you. Really, really interesting. Um, I lived in, one, in a village like some of the villages you described in, in Zimbabwe. Yes. 
And one of the things that struck me about that village was how the traditional healers, Nangas as they're known in Zimbabwe, <coughs> delivered a lot of care to people. And they also had an income flow because people brought them. So it was an economic model as well. <coughs> and I'm really interested to hear your views on to what extent you could actually use those people, extend their training and their education, and also use their authority. Because I think the model for community health workers doesn't tend to include them, really. Thank you. And <coughs> I'm interested to know why and whether you think that could change. Thank you. G great question. And, and, and do you mean, just to clarify, like traditional healers and... and yeah, traditional yeah. healers. And obviously yeah. they have a religious function. Sure. Which, which may be lots of health systems feel suspicious of. Yeah. And there's an issue of respect and, and, and uh, of the beliefs that they have, which right. clash with Western values and sure. Western beliefs. So it's a really problematic issue. Sure. But they do have a lot of power and capacity, and, and right. they get paid. Yeah. I, I think you're absolutely right. I think they have a great role to play. And you're right, they're not involved enough in these programs. Um, you know, probably the, the, the greatest experience we've had with this is with trained traditional midwives who have been the actual, for generations, the ones who help with home births. Because, again, you look at the log bridges that people like Zakba, who is a mother herself, have to cross. It happens at home, even if we don't want it to happen at home. We know it's not safe. Um, there was a, a, a midwife in one of these villages, and we were asking how we could work with her. And she said, look, I, I, she mentioned chickens. And I said, well, what do you mean, chickens? And she said, well, when I help with the birth, the community gives me a chicken. And that's to show respect and to move gratitude. So if you're going to come in here, I need to keep my chickens. Uh, because it's, 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 it's an honor and respect. And, and you know, what that conversation helped us realize was that there is obviously a way of life and a real important resource in this person. Of course, obviously, mothers were coming to her. Um, she had lots of chickens. Uh, and what we did was, when we trained Zakpa, for instance, was to have her pair up with that worker uh, and train. While that worker may not be interested or have the skills in, say, doing my blood pressure, um, which is such an exciting thing to do, trust me. Uh, she actually has been trying to work on maternal care. So we actually gave those midwives um, the home birth kits in case of emergencies, had them be the first responder in terms of history taking, and then said to them, if you would refer the mothers in to um, the clinic and have our worker work with you on a birth plan, then we won't give you chickens, because uh, we don't do farms, but uh, we will give you $3 uh, to refer someone in. And, and that has, part of the reason I think the facility-based delivery stayed up was because of that structure that was in. And that was all the traditional midwives that made that possible along with these workers. So I think that type of effort's really critical. I don't see why we'd want to miss the asset itself. If you just think of it from pure program economics, if you didn't care anything about the culture or the history of these places, which obviously we do. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, I, I'm Bert Hirschhorn. Yeah. Thank you very much for your, you. your inspirational talk. I've had some experience with the community health worker program in Nepal, yeah. uh, where every vertical program tried to tack on and piggyback onto these workers. Yeah. So first they were malaria, then they were immunization, then they were maternal child health, then they were diarrheal disease, et cetera, et cetera. So they, by the time the health worker got to the house, he had seven or eight different programs, yeah. doing a checklist, interviewing the mother who's got to be busy with her children and out in the field. Right. Uh, how do you protect against that kind of uh, siloization? Yeah, I, 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 think it's, I, I think it's a very tough challenge. Um, you know, unfortunately, not enough um, uh, operation-style research has been done to make any generalizable claims about the, the answer, which, and, and I want to thank you for your work on, on, on ORS and just what you've done for so many decades, which our, we, our people benefit from. Um, and I think you'd probably agree, there has not been done enough systematic research on asking even that question, what is the task load for these workers that is manageable. And you know, there probably isn't a finite level. I mean, my, my guess is at some point there is, but it varies. There's probably a variance. It's not a one size fits all. And there are probably predictors of workers that are more able and those that aren't. 
Um, the, the one example we have and we were inspired by is the Alaskan example. The Alaskans 50 years ago tackled a modern plague, tuberculosis, in the 40s and 50s. They did it by recruiting local women to distribute isoneazid treatment. Um, 10 years later, they did vaccines. 10 years later, they did chronic diseases. 10 years later, they did et cetera, et cetera. In 2001, I was out there helping them put EKG leads on patients in remote rural outposts that now they were helping staff. Uh, to make sure you could tell between cardiac chest pain and non-cardiac chest pain and know when to bring the bush plane over to evacuate somebody to a hospital. Um, you know, it took them a very long time to get to that point, but the fact that a worker with similar educational backgrounds, just as remote, 600,000 people, 600,000 square miles, and you got the tundra to deal with, you can't build roads, uh, and they managed to do that over that time. My guess is that, that we have that opportunity, but it won't come without more resources for, for evaluation of these programs. Raj, it was so great to um, see the Sherry, pictures yeah. and the names of those really brave workers. Uh, it's so good to, to give them the credit that they deserve. And you're probably the only person who could answer this question. Um, it's a two-part. I get nervous is, when you say that, Sherry. <laughs> um, you, you know, there was this huge issue with paying the frontline Ebola workers yeah. and, and, and never could figure out because it was one of the first things the World Bank did when Ebola sort of got onto the stage and saw it going out of control was they said, let's get money out there for these frontline yeah. um, national workers. But it, it, there were so many difficulties getting that to the people. So can you explain why that, wa why that is? And then looking forward with this plan to train the 5,000 workers, how will they be integrated into a health system that's having trouble paying yeah. you know, health, health workers? Have, is there a plan that's evolving? What are yeah. the obstacles and how can they be solved? Yeah, it's a great question. I had the same concerns because even before Ebola, we had the first ever strike of health workers about four or five months before Ebola. Um, and and for, for a lot of valid reasons. I mean, people were not getting paid. Uh, and workers that existed were not getting paid. And so, um, you know, what we during the Ebola crisis, they managed to do it. And here's how they did it. George Werner, who's now the Minister of Education, was the director of payroll. He had worked on a biometric system for teachers because teachers were also on these ghost payrolls and not getting care. Now, here's a Liberian man who decided he would do this um, uh, and put in a biometric system and was able to, sh and guess what they needed else was bank accounts. These rural teachers didn't have bank accounts, so they couldn't direct transfer payroll like many of us get our pay uh, payment. Um, and they just implemented those two very simple administrative processes and they were able to improve, not s perfect, but improved to a rate where now donors had more confidence in themselves, the government had more confidence putting money into teachers. They implemented, they, they committed to implement the payroll system for banking, as I understand from George, for these health workers. And that gave the confidence for some of this to go through. Now how successful that was, I'm not sure, but because it was in the, during the middle of a crisis. But I think those are the kind of, you know, it's hard to even call them innovations because they're so basic. Uh, but there certainly can be reforms that are put into these places. And I think that's, that's possible. Of course, we need a lot in these places without mobile phones, banks, to use technology to help um, uh, so you're not carrying cash in a, in a sachet. Um, but, you know, I think with data, you can do that in a health program. We have a living census number for every person, number for every hut, a number for every village. Um, and that's how we found out the census was off in, in a couple of places. And so we can get that level of data. I'm confident we could do the same kind of numeracy for these workers. Uh, if, 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 again, the funding goes to execution capacity, that's not a sexy thing to fund, um, you know, bank payrolls, um, but, but it certainly has a big, big benefit. Hi. Okay. Okay. Thank you. My name is Carl LaRue. I am at Princeton at the moment, but I work mostly in South Africa in a rural hospital, yeah. um, and I work with community health workers, and I couldn't kind of um, agree with you more how important community health workers are for us to deliver health care to the most needy people in, in South Africa, in Africa, in the world. And I think for, for me, my, my question just for you is in, term, in the Liberian context, what do you do to link these community health workers into the primary health care system, to clinics and to district hospitals? And have you been able to make the links kind of in the district health system in terms of having a link from community all the way through to the district hospital, yeah. and, and how, how does one do that? The district became a lot more excited when they, uh, because they have to report to county and county has to report to central, and when they realized that they could get much better data 
about their populations. They got very excited about integrating. That was just at the beginning. Um, when they saw that their metrics, facility-based delivery starts with facility, um, you cannot achieve that metric without having a great birth plan in the village, prenatal care that's delivered for a while, and a path to get to the hospital or the clinic. Um, they got excited to see that that would be, uh, it could be achieved. The, having a nurse supervisor, a clinical supervisor, we use physician assistants, midwives, or nurses, to coach these workers in pretty defined ratios. This is something the Alaskans did many decades ago, having a clinical coach. Again, I don't know whether it's needed in rural or urban settings. It's certainly needed in remote settings where you ha are so far away from clinic that you have to increase the scope of service and make sure it's done well. So the nurse herself, Alice in this case, is, is the physical human link between those two, and that's been a, a great help. I, I think IRC might be here, but they've been a great collaborator on this, as has been UNICEF. Um, there, there's a manual. Um, in advocating for something very similar, and the government has picked this up, uh, having these supervisors as part of the national model. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I now want to uh, invite everybody to reconvene over in our conference room for the next uh, panel, which will begin at 1.30. It features Nobel laureate.